Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of Conservation Conversations. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here this evening, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to the opportunity to share some background about one of my favorite cities in all of South Africa, Port Elizabeth, or as it's more uh, recently known, Kebeja. You see that for more than half of my life I was based in the Eastern Cape, and so many of the sites that we'll be covering this evening are places where I've spent endless days um, exploring in pursuit of birds. In my opinion, some of the sites that we'll be covering are without a doubt some of South Africa's top birding sites, hosting several of our most sought-after species, as well as some interesting endemics and near-endemics, and I can't wait to share them with you this evening on this virtual tour. To begin by giving you a short introduction to the city itself, Port Elizabeth is centred around two major seaports, the Port of Port Elizabeth and the Kucha Industrial Development Zone, which hosts one of the largest seaports in all of South Africa. Port Elizabeth is the sixth most populous city in all of South Africa and constitutes the second largest met metropolitan district area in South Africa by order of its size. The city forms the cultural and economic centre of the Eastern Cape, holding an, a major international airport, a major university, and an immense industrial area linked to these two major seaports. The city is built along the western edge of the Algoa Bay and the Nelson Mandela municipality into which the city of Port Elizabeth is included, extends from the Van Stardens River all the way in the west, all the way through to the Sundays River in the east, and the municipality is flanked to the east by the Addo Elephant National Park and to the west by the Bavians Kloof Wilderness Area, two sites that we'll be more talking about in more detail in a few moments' time. The first documented records of European mariners vit visiting Algoa Bay were Portuguese explorers who first visited and landed on St. Croix and Bird Islands, two small islands within the Algoa Bay, in the years 1488 and 1497. For nearly two centuries, the area appeared on European navigation charts, marked only as a place where you could land to get fresh water. The region was then subject to a rather turbulent history between the settlement of the Dutch East India Company in 1652 and the formation of the Union of South Africa in 1610. The city was founded as Port Elizabeth only as recently as the year 1820 by the government of the Cape Colony, and this was when some 4,000 British colonists settled in Algoa Bay. The primary pur purpose of the settlement at the time was to strengthen the border between the Cape Colony to the west and the Xhosa settlements further to the east. The city was named after the late wife of Rufan Shaw Donkin, the acting governor of the Cape Colony at the time. However, much more recently, the Eastern Cape Geographical Naming Committee have taken the decision to rename the city as Kebeja after the Xhosa and Southern Ku name for the Barkins River, which flows through the very heart of the city. Port Elizabeth has since grown into South Africa's sixth most populous city, as I previously mentioned. The city itself forms the eastern limit of the Garden Route, a major tourism hub in South Africa, and it forms the gateway for tourism in the Eastern Cape. Due to its moderate climate, the city has been ranked as one of the most pleasant cities in the world in terms of its year-round weather, and the city has become famous for its blue flag beaches, its proximity to the Addo Elephant National Park, and its popularity as both a local and an international holiday destination. In spite of its recent poor report, the construction of the Kucha Industrial Development Zone has also implied that the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Bay Area has been the subject of foreign, direct and national level investment, improving both social and economic standards within this previously uh, quite impoverished area of South Africa. Since inception, Kucha is estimated to have attracted an investment of some 140 billion rand into the economy of the Eastern Cape, and the harbour itself has created some 45,000 jobs. 
The city is frequently named the Windy City or the Friendly City, and both of these names speak immense truth. Any of you that have visited the Eastern Cape will know that PE is known for the gale force winds that occasionally batter through the city. But doubling back to the city acting as a tourism gateway for the Eastern Cape, the city is known for its affordability, for the friendliness of its people, and the city has had something of a recent facelift with enormous investments to redo the beachfront and to revive some of the older suburbs within the city. Now from an ecological perspective, Port Elizabeth and the Greater Algoa Bay area play host to a large percentage of South Africa's biological diversity, and this region is the confluence of five of our seven biomes in South Africa. Now, if you don't know what a biome is, a biome is a vegetation type that is characterized by a certain group of plant species that um, are easily identifiable and which tend to dominate certain areas. In South Africa, we have seven biomes, and within the vicinity of Port Elizabeth, one is able to easily access five of these. These are the Albany Thicket Biome, which you can quite clearly see in this map, Uh, illustrated by the darker green areas, and you'll note that this biome is almost entirely restricted to the Eastern Cape. Other important biomes include forest, fainbos, grassland, namakaroo, savanna, and in certain parts as you head north from the city, succulent karoo. From a birding perspective, this means that one is easily able to access an immense diversity of habitats within easy reach of the city, and each of these habitats plays host to a unique assemblage of species, so one can put together a fairly impressive uh, list of birds by visiting sites within quite close proximity to one another. Over and above the terrestrial ecosystems, Port Elizabeth also boasts an incredible selection of freshwater estuarine and marine habitats, further augmenting the list of species that are possible to see within the city limits. Four particular sites of importance are the Swartkorps estuary, a major wintering ground for shorebirds in South Africa, the marine section of Addo Elephant National Park, including St. Croix and Bird Islands, hosting some of South Africa's most important seabird breeding colonies, Cape Recife Nature Reserve within the very heart of the city, and then the Alexandria dune fields just to the east of the city, which happen to be the largest intact dune systems in the world, covering 15,000 hectares, stretching 80 kilometers of coastline, and reaching a maximum width of about 5 kilometers in certain places. What this ultimately translates to is that an incredibly high diversity of bird species can be found within easy reach of the city. As one of South Africa's most biologically diverse provinces, the Eastern Cape supports well in excess of 600 bird species. Top birders within the province amass lists in the region of about 550 bird species, including vagrants. So within about 150 kilometers from the city, one has opportunity to look for well in excess of 350 different bird species across all of the habitats that I just mentioned. Top among these are species that are highly localized within a national context, such as the roseate and Damara terns, Neisner woodpecker, Neisner warbler, and the complete suite of Cape endemics, including the Cape rock jumper, Cape sugarbird, Protea seed eater, and in places, even the inexplicably rare Feinbos button quail. Many of these bird species are at the extreme distributional limits within Port Elizabeth, but at least for some, I'll go so far as to say that some sites within Port Elizabeth are the very best places to look for these species within South Africa. But before we start looking at each habitat individually, and what sites you must visit in order to cover these core habitats, I want to direct you towards the recently launched Go Birding platform, available on BirdLife South Africa's website. Tonight I'm only going to be able to give you a brief introduction to the wider Port Elizabeth area. However, I was personally responsible for the Eastern Cape content on the Go Birding platform, and we have covered 68 sites in total in the Eastern Cape including 33 sites that are within easy reach of Port Elizabeth, all within about an hour to an hour and a half's drive of the city itself. 
Each site is covered in detail with a background description of the site, including a list of key species that you should look for, important contacts or other details about entrance fees and gate times, and a selection of images to show you some of what you can expect if you plan to visit these areas. All of the sites that I'll be talking about this evening are covered by the GoBirding platform. So without wasting any more time, let's have a look at some of the key habitats in and around Port Elizabeth, including some of the key sites that you should try and visit, starting of course with the marine and coastal environments. Four key sites, if you will, come to mind. The first being the Cape Recife Nature Reserve. Now this is pictured on the upper left-hand panel of my screen at the moment, and this is arguably one of the top marine and coastal birding sites anywhere in South Africa. Species that are very characteristic of the site include the terns, at least five or six different species can be seen at any one time. There are a number of distinctly seasonal species, and I'll speak to that in a few moments' time. In addition to that, cormorants and gulls tend to be quite prolific. The nearby Swartkorps estuary on the eastern side of Port Elizabeth is fantastic for shorebirds and is arguably one of the top wintering sites for shorebirds anywhere in South Africa. Although there are some safety concerns visiting the Swartkorps estuary, it is certainly worth stopping in at uh, several important vantage points over the estuary and with the use of a telescope uh, um, tool that will be both important at Cape Recife and at Swartkorps Estuary, uh, you have the chance at seeing a number of different shorebird species, including excellent chances at both uh, greater sand plover and red knot. For those with a little bit more time and perhaps feeling a bit more adventurous, you may wish to take a boat trip to the Algo Bay Islands in including St. Croix and uh, Bird Island, and here you stand an excellent chance at seeing African penguins as well as Cape Gannet. The Algo Bay supports the largest uh, remaining populations of both of these threatened near-endemic species. And then, of course, you can do a pelagic trip out of uh, Port Elizabeth, and although the pelagics in the Eastern Cape are perhaps less well known than in the Cape, we have seen such excellent species as the black-bellied storm petrel and northern royal albatross on our tours out of Port Elizabeth. Just to give you a bit more of an indication of what it's like to bird at Cape Recife, Cape Recife marks the uh, point of the Algoa Bay, um, so it is quite exposed. It's a site that you would want to visit in fair weather, and I tend to find that it's best to visit this site when the tide is pushing. The reasoning being, as you can see in this image, there are some rocks that um, extend out into the water, and ideally you want to get there when the water is uh, pushing in, thereby forcing the turns a little bit closer to you. A scope is highly recommended when visiting Cape Recife Nature Reserve, but it is not um, critical, especially at high tide. At just 15 minutes away from the Port Elizabeth CBD, Cape Recife is an absolute must stop for seabird watching in particular for its turns. Cape Recife is famous for its turns, and this is arguably the best turn watching spot in all of South Africa. On a standard day's visit, one has an excellent chance of seeing five or six different species of turn, and the greater crested turn pictured up in the uh, upper left-hand panel of my screen with the bright yellow bill tends to dominate the flock um, in the turn roost. With them, one normally has an excellent chance at seeing the common tern, usually present throughout the year, although this is primarily a summer visiting species, and the sandwich tern, one of our medium-sized tern species. Depending on what time of year you're then visiting, you also then stand an excellent chance at three of our more sought-after tern species, top among them the Damara tern. Now the Damara tern is one of our two smallest tern species. This species actually breeds in the nearby Alexandria dune field, and at certain times of the year, mainly in the summer months, one has a chance of seeing these birds coming into roost at Cape Recife. It's never an abundant species, one usually only sees two or three individuals at a time, and these birds tend to avoid sitting with the other terns in the big roost. So generally the Damara terns are found on the beach or um, on the shallow rocks uh, nearer to the beach. If they do join the uh, mixed flock, they tend to be quite obvious in that they keep to the very edge of the flock 
um, they never really sit in the center of the, the roost with the other tern species. If you then visit in the winter months, you stand an excellent chance at seeing the roseate, which is arguably the best looking of all of the tern species, pictured in the lower right hand panel, as well as the Antarctic tern, a seasonal visitor from the southern oceans. Cape Recif is also a fantastic spot for several species of cormorant, as well as for a number of pelagic seabirds that occasionally wander inshore, and on a standard day's visit, one has a very good chance of seeing birds like the subantarctic skewer, or if you spend enough time watching out beyond the waves, the white-chinned petrel or the sooty shearwater. From time to time, it is then possible to see African penguin at Cape Recife, though this does require an immense amount of luck picking them out between the waves behind the breakers. And then the site has played host to a number of rarities over the years, most recently a lesser noddy that turned up. But other species that have occasionally been seen here include the American golden plover, the lesser black-backed gull, red-footed booby, and bro both the bridled and the sooty terns. The nearby Swartkorps estuary is then located 14 kilometers to the east of Port Elizabeth and is arguably one of the top estuaries in South Africa for shorebirds. The estuary itself is tidal for 16 kilometers and reaches a maximum width of about three and a half kilometers near the mouth. So when the tide recedes, the estuary reveals an expanse of mudflats that can support anything between about 14 and a half and 20,000 shorebirds in the summer months. It's unsurprising then that the Swartkorps estuary has been identified as an important bird area as it plays close to considerable numbers of shorebirds and top among these are the sandling, the bar-tailed godwit, the marsh sandpiper and the kitlitzer's plover pictured here. Several scarcer species can also be found from time to time including the red knot, greater sand plover and Eurasian curlew as well as several rarities that have turned up, including the spur-winged lapwing seen recently, the common red shank, as well as the broad-billed sandpiper. Now one does have to be quite careful at the Swartkorps estuary in that there have been a number of safety issues in the recent past. However, please don't let that deter you. If you remain vigilant, visit a number of uh, well-known vantage points over the estuary, you do stand an excellent chance of seeing many of the aforementioned species without putting yourself at any risk. Once again, all of these details are listed on the Go Birding platform. I also mentioned that it is possible to do a pelagic off of Port Elizabeth, and this photograph was taken on one of our recent trips, highlighting considerable numbers of seabirds in attendance at a fishing vessel, arguably one of the top bird watching experiences out there. And finally, I'd like to just highlight that the two clusters of islands, including Bird and St. Croix Islands, that are encompassed within the marine portion of Addo Elephant National Park within Algoa Bay, host globally significant populations of several of South Africa's near-endemic seabirds. Top among these are the African penguin and the Cape gannet, and Bird and St. Croix Islands collectively support in the region of about 11,000 African penguins and 83,000 pairs of Cape gannet. These islands also host important breeding colonies of African oyster catcher, kelp gull, and both the Cape and white-breasted cormorant, as well as some 200 pairs of roseate terns, Bird Island being only one of two sites anywhere in South Africa where roseate tern are known to breed. Now, although both of these islands are listed as nature reserves and they're only possible to visit for research purposes, it is possible to take a boat to pay witness to the incredible numbers of seabirds that use these islands as a breeding site. And I can highly recommend this as an activity if you are visiting Port Elizabeth. Leaving the marine environments behind and moving inland slightly, there are a number of interesting wetlands, lagoons and salt pans surrounding Port Elizabeth and these sites are always worthy of a visit. Key sites to consider include the Tankatara Road and Tankatara Salt Pans, the Cerebos Salt Pans, the Sundays River and the Sundays River Mouth. Key species that you would expect to look for at these sites include various species of shorebird, flamingos, waterfowl, 
and the white-fronted bee-eater here at the very southern limit of its distribution. So to highlight some of the species that are possible at these sites, the Tankatara salt works host a small population of chestnut-banded plovers, and this is arguably one of the better sites in the country to look for this incredibly endearing species. They tend to be quite obvious along the edges of the salt pans, given that they have this beautiful silvery cast to their plumage, but they do occur alongside several other species of shorebird, and it does take a bit of a trained eye to pick them out. The same salt pans then support a small population of black-necked grebes, and this is perhaps the most reliable site anywhere in the Eastern Cape to see this incredibly unusual species. And then between the Tankatara salt works, the neighbouring Cerebos salt works, and the Sundays River mouth, one usually has a fairly good opportunity to study both greater and lesser flamingos side by side. The Sunday's River Mouth then plays host to a small breeding colony of white-fronted bee-eaters at the very southern limit of its distribution, and they can usually be seen attending nest holes in the vertical sandbanks along the Sunday's River, particularly within the higher reaches closer to the Tankatara salt pans. The mouth of the Sunday's River is then a reliable site to see Terek Sandpiper and Eurasian Curlew during the summer months, and this site has played host to several interesting rarities in recent years, top among them the Sooty Gull. A large tern roost forms at the Sunday's River mouth as well, and this is arguably one of the better sites to look for roseate and Damara terns as well, although the viewing opportunities generally aren't quite as good as at Cape Recife Nature Reserve. Of course it's never guaranteed, but some of these sites have also played host to several of South Africa's rarest vagrant species. Many of you will recall that the little ringed plover was photographed at the Tankatara salt pan several years back, and this started one of the most exciting twitches I think in South African birding history, when in the following days a citrine wagtail was photographed at the same site, almost side by side with the little ringed plover, and shortly thereafter, an Upshur's warbler, a first record for the southern African subregion, was photographed in the bushes neighbouring the salt pans. The nearby Sunday's River Mouth has also played host to a number of other vagrant species, including the recent sooty gull, Eurasian oyster catcher, sooty tern, as well as bridal tern. So when birding these areas, it's always keep, uh, worth keeping your eye out for something unusual, something different, and you never know what might turn up. Moving away from the wetland ecosystems, one enters an interesting mosaic of grassland and fainbos habitats. The vegetation composition within these areas serves as an interesting mix between these two key biomes, and the contribution of the fainbos vegetation to the species richness and endemism of the region is overwhelming. Many key South African endemic bird species reach their eastern distributional limit within the vicinity of Port Elizabeth, and most are fairly easily seen at a few sites within this region. Top sites include the Humansdorp grasslands, grasslands surrounding the small town of Humansdorp, the Careerdo Mountain, Lady Slipper Nature Reserve, as well as the eastern Baviaanskloof. And some of the species you would expect to see in these areas include a full suite of Cape endemics, the Black Harrier, White-Bellied Bustard, Cape Clapperlock, Red-Winged Franklin, and even a small relict population of African Grass Owl. Now a few of these species are quite site-specific, and so one does have to access certain parts in order to see some of these species, but, but the grasslands tend to be one of the easier habitats to bird in and around Port Elizabeth. The very best site are the grasslands near the small town of Humansdorp, and by exploring the network of farm roads just to the west of Port Elizabeth, one has the opportunity to look for such interesting species as the near-endemic black harrier, the scarce white-bellied or barrows bustard or koran, the blue crane, and even the Cape clapper lark, here at the very eastern limit of its distribution. To access the fainbos habitats, one has to get up into the higher reaches of some of the mountains in these areas. And in the, these mountain fainbos habitats, one has the chance of seeing the full complement of Cape endemic species. 
The Proteus seed eaters found at the very summits of some of these mountains, in particular in areas where you get a protea by the name of the Warbworm, the largest of all of the protea species. And if you can find a flowering Warbworm, you're almost certain to see the protea seed eater. This is perhaps one of the hardest of the Cape endemics to find, but there are a number of reliable sites in order to see the species. The Cape uh, Rock Jumper also occurs at the very top of the Carriadu Mountain, which is the very eastern limit of the species distribution, um, and it is a fairly reliable site for the species, although access can be quite challenging at times. And then more widespread Fainbos endemics that occur include the Cape Sugarbird, Orange-Breasted Sunbird, Victorin's Warbler, and the Cape Siskin, while the inexplicably rare uh, Fainbos button quail has also been sighted at a few sites on occasion. Although there are a number of areas further to the east and the west that may serve you better, there are also a number of small forest patches in the vicinity of Port Elizabeth, and each of these patches are home to a very interesting selection of forest-dwelling species. Now these forest patches tend to be surrounded by areas of Albany thicket, the forests themselves occur at the valley bottoms and along small drainage lines, and two of the sites that immediately come to mind are both to the west of Port Elizabeth, namely the Van Staden's Wildflower Reserve and the Island Nature Reserve. Now a selection of really interesting forest species can quite easily be seen at two of these two sites and the Island Nature Reserve boasts a wonderful bird hide where it's possible to spend several hours watching these shy forest dwelling species emerge from the dense dark thickets to drink at a small forest pool. Some of the key species that you'll want to look for including, include the Narina trogon, the blue mantled crested flycatcher and the black bellied starling. Interestingly, the black-bellied starling is a species that's moved out of these forest sites and into suburban parts of Port Elizabeth, and is quite a common species now within many parts of the city. The olive bushrike also occurs and is best detected by its loud song, although the species is quite reclusive. The forests in the vicinity of Port Elizabeth are then arguably some of the better forests anywhere in the country to look for the endemic Neisner woodpecker and Neisner warbler. Knowledge of the song of both of these species is absolutely essential to finding them, and both species are best detected in the summer months when they are most vocally active. Another summer visiting species to this area is the absolutely indescribable African emerald cuckoo, and once again, knowledge of this species' uh, loud ringing song is essential to finding them. They can be notoriously difficult to spot in the tops of uh, the forest canopy when they aren't singing. And then finally, the Island Nature Reserve is one of the better sites in the country to see the shy and incredibly reclusive lemon dove. So to just reiterate some of the species that are possible, the Barrett's warbler pictured here is a winter visitor to this area, and it co-occurs alongside the potentially more common, um, but uh, far more skulking, Neisner warbler, both species within the genus Bredipterus, known for their skulking hab habits. The Narina trogon is then a prevalent feature of these forests, particularly in the summer months when the males become vocally active and the distinctive hooting call of these incredibly plumaged birds is a constant echo throughout some of these forest sites. The endemic Neisner woodpecker is best searched for in this area, and in fact the entrance road to Cape Recife Nature Reserve is an excellent spot to look for this particular species. And then one of the more common forest dwelling species is the forest canary, a species best detected by its song in that it tends to stay up in the higher parts of the canopy, uh, but this species is quite common throughout these forests. Heading east out of the city, one quickly enters an area of extensive savanna and Albany thicket. Interestingly enough, the thicket biome is entirely endemic to and is extremely characteristic of the Eastern Cape. It is dominated by several plant species that have almost become synonymous with the Eastern Cape, including aloe ferox and speckworm. And many of you will know that aloe ferox is even featured on the number plates of vehicles registered to the Eastern Cape. Now some of the key sites that you'll want to visit to explore these habitats include the extensive Addo Elephant National Park, 
There are patches of it within Cape Reef Nature Reserve, as well as the Island Nature Reserve, a bit closer to Port Elizabeth. And some of the species that you want to look for include the Cape Bulbul, here at the very eastern limit of its distribution, the notoriously skulking Southern Chagra, Southern Black Koran, Pale Chanting Goshawk, Denham's Bustard, and the Secretary Bird. Some of the more common features of these habitats include the red-fronted tinkerbird, a species that calls endlessly throughout the heat of the day in the thicket biome. The southern fiscal is then very common and prevalent throughout this habitat, as is the cape starling, previously cape glossy starling. And then there are a number of interesting sunbird species that move into these areas, particularly when the aloes come into bloom, this is an amethyst sunbird, but a number of other species are possible, including the greater double-collared sunbird, the collared sunbird, as well as the malachite sunbird. It would then be an injustice to talk about Port Elizabeth and not pay tribute to Allo Elephant National Park. Now, this is one of South Africa's smaller national parks, although it's one of South Africa's most popular na national parks. And this further just emphasizes the importance of Port Elizabeth as the tourism hub within the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. Addo is a big five reserve, so it's possible to see lion, leopard, elephant, rhino and uh, Cape Buffalo within the reserve, but it's also particularly well known for some of Africa's lesser known mammals, including a variety of smaller mammal species, as well as the spotted hyena. There is a fantastic rest camp within the uh, reserve, right in the very northern reaches of the reserve near the town of Addo, and the site is very easily visited as a day trip from Port Elizabeth. Some of Addo's most prevalent bird species include both the southern black koran and the secretary bird, which are possible to see in the open parts of the reserve, particularly in the northern reaches. And then within the thicket parts uh, further to the south, you look for species such as the southern chagra, the karoo scrub robin, and the bokmakiri, all of which are fairly commonly found. Heading north out of the city, one quite quickly crosses a series of mountains, and in the rain shadow to the north of these mountains, one enters the dry expanse of the Karoo. Now, the Karoo is an expansive and breathtaking landscape, characterized by uh, stunted, drought-resistant vegetation, and this dry, endless landscape is broken only by tall, isolated, flat-top peaks, which give the Karoo its characteristic skyline. Now, the area supports surprising biodiversity in spite of its aridity, and many bird species can be found within these parts. Some of the key birds that you want to look for in the Karoo include an abundance of larks, various species of bustard and koran, and the pale chanting goshawk, which is arguably one of the most characteristic birds of this Karoo ecosystem. Some of the birds you want to look for in the Karoo in the re regions to the north of Port Elizabeth include the endearing near-endemic rufous-eared warbler. This is arguably one of the most abundant birds throughout any Karoo landscape, and as soon as you tune into the species' high-pitched piercing call, you pick them up absolutely everywhere, but it's an absolutely gorgeous little bird. Along the dry river courses throughout the Karoo, you often get patches of sweet thorn acacia, and within these habitats, one has the opportunity to look for the chestnut vented and layered warblers, previously the chestnut vented and layered tit babblers, as well as species such as the grey and southern black tits, as well as Cape penduline tit and fairy flycatcher. Out on the dry open plains, there's an abundance of lark species. The bird in the lower left-hand panel of my screen now is the chestnut, uh, sorry, grey-backed sparrow lark. The species moves into these arid areas after rain. Um, it's often totally absent, but is one of several lark species that can be seen within these parts. And then I mentioned bustards are quite prevalent, and the Ludwig's bustard is a fairly uh, regular species in the Karoo north of Port Elizabeth. I have also seen the species as close to Port Elizabeth as the Tankatara saltworks, which I discussed earlier. I thought to end my talk this evening by suggesting two day trips that would not only see you visiting several sites in the immediate vicinity of Port Elizabeth, but would also give you access to a range of different habitats and therefore a range of different species, fulfilling a full day of birding. 
The first extends east out of Port Elizabeth in the direction of the Tankatara Salt Works where you would begin your day, and here you would look for species such as the chestnut banded plover, both greater and lesser flamingos, as well as black necked grebe. A visit to the nearby Sunday's River mouth would also offer you the opportunity to look for the Terek Sandpiper and Eurasian Curlew, noting that some of these species are summer visitors only. Small numbers do occasionally overwinter, but that isn't guaranteed. If you are feeling adventurous and you uh, are prepared to walk nearer the Sunday's River mouth from where the parking area is, you would also have the opportunity to look for a very uh, a selection of different seabird species, including chances for Damara and Roseate Terns, depending on what time you visited. And from there you could visit the Addo Elephant National Park, where the three most uh, iconic species that you would want to look for include the Southern Chagra, Cape Bulbul, and the scarce Nisner Woodpecker, which is best detected by its high-pitched piercing call. You would also then have the opportunity to enjoy the various mammals that are on offer in Addo Elephant National Park before ultimately returning back to Port Elizabeth. The second day trip would involve a start at Cape Recife Nature Reserve within the very heart of the city, taking note that it would be better to visit Cape Recife on the pushing tide, uh, nearer the high tide, which means that the turns will be closer to the beach thereby offering you the best possible viewing and photographic opportunities. From there, you could visit the nearby Island Nature Reserve, which is located near the small suburb of Sea View, just to the west of Port Elizabeth, and here you would have the opportunity to look for some forest-dwelling species, such as the Lemon Dove and the Narina Trogon. Ultimately, you could end your day at the Van Staden's Wildflower Reserve and Ladies Slipper, where it's possible to see a number of Cape endemics, including the Cape Sugarbird, Cape Siskin, and Orange-Breasted Sunbird. Both of these day trips should deliver anything between about 120 and 150 different bird species, or up to 200 species in the summer months, depending on how hard you wish to bird these sites. Both day trips would involve little more than about 80 kilometers worth of driving. All of these sites are within very easy reach of Port Elizabeth. So that's all from me this evening. I do have a few photographic credits that I would just like to acknowledge. Um, I will be online this evening if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask. But thank you very much for tuning into this episode of Conservation Conversations. It's been an absolute pleasure for me to introduce you to the birding sites in and around South Africa's friendly city. <laughs>